The Magic Show is brought to you by StarCityGames.com. And check this out. On October 1st, the StarCityGames.com Open Series comes to Indianapolis. And this event is going to be huge. We're talking hundreds of players, over $14,000 in cash prizes, at least 18 players qualifying for the Charlotte Invitational at the end of the year. Live coverage all day, courtesy of SCG Live, and as much Magic the Gathering as we can pack into one weekend. So make plans to join StarCityGames.com in Indianapolis, and we'll see you there. Hi, this is Aaron Forsyth, Director of Magic R&D, and welcome to The Magic Show. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Dear, 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 Everybody and welcome to another edition of the Magic Show. This week we're going to be talking about Innistrad spoilers, and who boy are they friggin' sweet! The most incredibly rich and flavorful set I've ever seen in Magic. We are in for a treat. You ready? Let's go. So I'm going down my list and pulling out my favorites. Let's talk about some cards. Now first up is Angelic Overseer. Now this girl, she is deceptively sexy. You know they said Baneslayer Angel wouldn't be played until it had hexproof and. Well, there's the indestructibility to boot. Now, the bane of this card is Slagstorm, but I'm glad it has one. This is a freakishly good and scary angel in the right deck, and there will only be more and more powerful humans printed in Dark Ascension and beyond. Definitely one to watch. Now, how about some cube goodies? Yes, CubeDrafting.com is back open for business, and I'll be working on my Innistrad updates shortly. And it's Cloistered Youth that is awesome. This card is simply a two-mana 3-3 three -three with a life payment drawback. Period. That is fantastic in any white weenie deck, whether it's constructed or my favorite limited format. Divine Reckoning is another interesting card, if only for the sweet interaction with Liliana and the Veil that Mike Flores pointed out. Go ahead and destroy their team minus their best guy, and then they lose their best guy. Seems reasonable, particularly when you can flash back Wraths. Now, if you know me, you know I love a Cloud Goat Ranger, and they just printed another one. Geist Honored Monk is sick and will be kicking ass soon on tables near you. This girl, I swear, do people not remember how amazing Cloud Goat Ranger was? This card just does everything you want for the top of the curve in a creature deck. It's going to be a 4-4 or higher if you have at least one other creature when you play her, and the tokens fly. I remember R&D telling me that Cloud Goat Ranger probably slipped under the radar because of its un common rarity, and I don't think that's going to be a problem with the monk here. Mentor the Meek is the real deal. Quite simply, as far as I can remember, they've never given White Weenie such a card advantage engine. Sure, Pure Steel Paladin is one thing, and this guy is definitely going in that deck, as it's pretty unreal with living weapons like Flare Husk, and I'm excited to be drawing lots and lots of cards off that guy. But what's better than an Oblivion Ring? Well, a ring that stops them from even casting the spell, Nevermore is an interesting enchantment, allowing you to put the stops on the four cards in their deck, sometimes solving problems you never knew you had. I I do kind of wish I had been able to name Primeval Titan with this card in a previous metagame, you, you know what I'm saying? But next up is Stony Silence. Yeah, that's Null Rod. And yes, it doesn't do anything, because it does nothing. Yep, good luck with those equipment activations, Affinity and Modern and Enchantress just died and went to heaven in Legacy. This is one of those beautiful silver bullets. I'm extremely happy it exists, and just how funny are Pure Steel Paladin Mirrors going to be thanks to this card? Awk awk. But let's get to the best color in the game, shall we? Blue and in Innistrad is friggin' sweet. Now, first up is Forbidden Alchemy. Now, already being called better than Mystical Teachings by some, this draw spell is nuts. While it reads closer to Impulse, the fact is the graveyard is a place to play in this new block of ours, and putting a card in our hand, the best in the top four, then dumping the rest with some flashback in the graveyard is always a good deal. If you haven't gotten your foils yet, you better get them soon. This will be a top-tier card for the next year. Seen play in virtually every deck that plays flashback spells, islands, and the best card in Innistrad, Snapcaster Mage. Oh yeah, baby. That's Captain Snaps, and he answers to no one else. This card is amazing, sick, ridiculous, powerful, impactful in every format. Talk about closing out the last Invitational with a bang. Now, if you recall, I actually played in that Invitational. Yes, a little over four years ago. You wonderful fans out there shipped me off to Europe to play Lorwyn Winston Draft, Cube Draft, Vintage, and more versus the best on the planet. Turns out, I did not win that tournament. But Tiago Chan did, thanks to bashing with Protean Hulk in the red zone and vintage, raw-dogging the fatty off a of black lotus. True story. 
and four years later, he got his due. And oh my God, seriously, Watsy, you outdid yourselves. This card is beautiful. Flash gives every single spell on your deck new life, makes every spell casting decision more interesting. Do I want to use this Day of Judgment now, flashback, or do I push it another turn and flashback it then? In Legacy, my God, this guy is bonkers. Rebuying brainstorms and pact negations and swords to plowshares and path exiles and lightning bolts and dazes and forces of will. Now do know, when you target Force of Will with Captain Snaps, you will not be able to remove a blue card and pay a life and flashback it. Because Snaps isn't making it flashback for its cost and or its alternative cost, it's just the mana cost. But even if 7 mana is a stretch, the fact that you can rebuy your counters is no joke. Wizards set out to make a kick-ass invitational card and by god they got there. To give you some perspective, Snapcaster Mage foils are now worth more than any other foil in the set, yes, more than foil planeswalkers. Sheesh. Moving on, Laboratory Maniac got every Johnny Giddy and falling over themselves, snatching up every foil leveler in existence. Yes, leveler is actually killing someone that isn't you until they bolt your Laboratory Maniac and then you look like an idiot. But that's what Dispel and other counters are for, right? Because Leveler isn't the only path to victory with this wacky guy. I mean, how about a little Mirror of Fate? Selective Memory and Treasure Hunt. The fun never ends, and I love how innocuous this guy is. A great ogre winning you the game for not having cards in your library? How cool is this set again? Moving on to black cards, Bloodline Keeper is fan-freaking-tastic. Do you know how powerful this guy is? Seriously? A 4-mana 3-3 flyer that sits around making 2-2 vampires and then transforms, which does not make him tap, so you can double Glorious Anthem your vampires and turn him into a freaking 5-5 flyer that starts making 4-4 vampires instead. That is, that is nuts. This is a guy good enough to keep vampires in Constructed, and I hope black-red vampires are here for a long time, even if they lost some of their awesome man lands and many of their awesome mainstay creatures. It's guys like this that make me think they'll stay on top. Other cards I like for vamps? A little bump in the night, perhaps? Now look, I understand this card is just a Lava Spike, but guess what I could never do with Lava Spike? Flashback it. This means you're getting twice the value. You now have something to pump your man into late game, and it's cards like Bump in the Night that keeps other players honest. Sure, they can stop your initial onslaught, but long-term life draining is how you finish those pesky control players off. How about a card with some real potential? Heartless Summoning is much like Laboratory Maniac. Extremely high variance in that if you don't draw it, your deck might not do much. But man, if you are drawing those Heartless Summoning copies to power out cheap Saul and Simulacrums and Worm Coil Engines, why not go bigger? How's that Garrick's Horde looking now? Sure, we're probably square in Magical Christmas Land here, but it's these types of cards that get you thinking and build decks all by themselves. Just imagine a team of guys while you control Heartless Summoning, Gliss of the Traitor, and a little tiny Perilous Mirror. Good times, I tell you. And now, man or skeleton, the question must be asked. Finishing out black, Unburial Rites is absolutely the real deal. This was the reanimation spell we were looking for, and it's even better than expected. This spell will be doing some serious damage with Forbidden Alchemy and Liliana of the Veil, bringing back the black-white control decks of old. Called Solar Flare back in Ravnica Standard, I can see its resurgence thanks to a spell this powerful, along with cards like Jin Jataxius hanging out and ready to end games in a hurry. Moving on to red, I'm just going to say it, Balefire Dragon was a terrible idea to print. It just doesn't fit into gothic horror. There are no dragons in gothic horror, and at best, a badass gargoyle would have been awesome. Instead, we get a really stylized dragon that looks like it's a reject from Mirrodin. The card is fine, if not silly, overpowered, and limited, but if this set is about flavor, don't screw it up. Don't put the dragons where they don't belong. No one puts Balefire in a corner, you know what I'm saying? Want to see the future of red decks? Look no further than Brimstone Volley. This card is going right in my cube and is ready to take a quarter out of people's life total one chunk at a time. But how about some sick reprints? I am super excited about Ancient Grudge, and can you say liquid metal coating? I knew you could. Such sick combos. But again, for the cube enthusiasts out there, I love me some Devil's Play. While it may make waves and constructed, I guarantee it's going to kick some cube ass. This card is better than Red Sun Zenith, pound for pound, and I can't wait to burn people out with it. If there is a big red deck, or a green red ramp deck in standard, I have a feeling this is going to be an all-star. How's about a hidden gem? Check out Falcon Wrath Marauders. Now, I know they don't look like much. I mean, a whopping five mana for just a 2-2? That has haste and 
and it flies and it puts two plus one plus one counters on it every time you hit them. Now Florence was on top of this one as well, putting that quick chart together, explaining that it turns out this guy is very close to another all-star red card, Demigod of Revenge. Now it's not reanimating itself by playing more copies, but it's bringing some serious damage and can kill you in just four hits. Hmm. But those werewolves, where am I on them right now? I actually am thinking they're going to see some constructive play. They're going to be few and far between for a while, but there's no doubt in my mind that we have some good ones. Now the red decks will probably be looking at Stormkirk struts a lot for their one drop, but Reckless Waif is no joke. This is very close to Goblin Guide, a card that has defined red decks for two years now. Turn one, they don't have a Bird of Paradise or a Ponder, well you're bashing for three damage on turn two. Bring in the beats, I love this girl a lot. Now as for green, we thought Beast Within was sweet, and here comes the follow up with Bramble Crush. Yep, Creeping Mold just got bigger, scarier, and uncut. This thing is killing planeswalkers and equipment and enchantments and lands and anything else that isn't a duder. A welcome and beautifully simple spell. I can't wait to have this as a deck building option. Now how's about a card full of potential? It's called Creeping Renaissance, and I'm pretty sure the scariest card type you're going to be naming is Planeswalker. Sure, I'll just rebuy my Gideon, Elspeth, and Garrick Relentless. Your turn. Speaking of, I hope no one has any doubts, Garrick Relentless is one of the best cards in the set. This guy is killing duders, he's working well with your own tokens to flip him, and once flipped, he's an absolute force to be reckoned with. Searching up the scariest creature in your deck every turn is serious business, people, and it will beat you senseless. Those who underestimate this planeswalker won't do so for long. Now last up for green, of course, is the awesome Tree of Redemption. Now talk about a wild design. I love this guy so much. The first time you read him, you just, you just gotta get that like, that wall, that wall look on your face, you know, followed by the realization that you can do some freakishly fun stuff with this guy. Now note, if your life total is one and you exchange those totals with Tree of Redemption's toughness, the tree's gonna be an O1. However, what, what if you just put that tree under a mimic vat, huh? That seems pretty good, doesn't it? Or cloning it at instant speed with another hidden gem in Innistrad, Cackling Counterpart. Rounding out the set, Geist of St. Traft is the real deal, people. Holy cow, does he seem pushed. Nice angel token, brah. Also makes for a great little interaction with Sundial of the Infinite to keep your token, but let's face it, you don't have to get cute with these shenanigans. You just need a sort of feast and famine and the red zone. Good old Saint here will do the rest. Lastly, you can't go wrong with these rare lands. How much do I love more land haunt? punches. Another card that will ensure blue-white decks remain a force in our new metagame, and you can discount slow but sure card and creature advantage. Creating evasive tokens is sure to please those who like to play with overpowered equipment, and I love how Keswick Wolfrun gives werewolf decks something to dump their mana into so they can flip their powerful creatures. Whew. And this is just my first overview. This isn't a whole set review or anything. You talk about a crazy set. We've only scratched the surface of what's possible in Innistrad, from decks that are meshing with Scars of Mirrodin to new archetypes we've never seen before. Next week, we'll take a look at some of the most innovative and exciting decks out there as we barrel toward the first big event of the new metagame, the Indianapolis Open on October 1st. So until next time, Magic players, this is Evan Irwin, tapping the cards so you don't have to. Like the fatties.